Great worship this morning, amen? amen? Glad that you're all here. Friday night as the uh, storms came through, I don't know about you all, but we lost power for a few moments. And in those few moments, uh, because we're staying down in a basement, a very nice basement, but in a basement, we had pretty much total darkness. And the first thought that Angie and I both had simultaneously, we need an alternate light source. And she thought, oh, I've got a Yankee candle in the other room, but no matches. <laughs> and, and then I remembered this little guy right here uh, plugged in. We're thankful that Dave and Kathy thought about ahead on these things. And it's a, it's a little flashlight. And it can do all sorts of things. And, and it's very ex- exciting. So I remembered this. And I got this ready and had it ready to go just in case we lost power again. Here's the thing about light. It's an incredibly practical thing. Without it, there's very little that we can actually do. We cannot build, we cannot navigate, we cannot discover. Abraham Lincoln said, the things I want to know are in books. My best friend is the man who'll get me a book that I haven't read yet. But he needed light to read those books at night, which is the time, the only time that he had to be able to read. As we will see in the coming weeks, the Sermon on the Mount is incredibly practical. It does not seek out to answer those deep metaphysical questions of human existence. Instead, it shows us how to live if we choose to be followers of Jesus Christ. And in doing so, actually does answer the questions of how should I live? That deep, deep question of our hearts. And like our passage last week, our passage this morning continues to set a foundation upon which the rest of this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, will rest. And last week we saw that following Jesus means redefining what success means or the successful or the blessed life looks like. This morning, we're going to see the purpose behind living differently. We're going to look just at a small passage of scripture here. And we begin in chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And then he takes a different metaphor and he says, you are also, you are the light of the world and a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So what do we learn from these verses here? Well, like salt and light, our call as followers of Jesus is to enhance our environments. That is wherever we're going. Jesus said that as you are going, make disciples. So wherever we're going, whatever we're doing, whether we're at home, we're at work, at school, on the playground, on the ball field, the stadium, wherever we are at, we should let our light shine. Whether we're in rural areas or inner cities, our job is to enhance the environment in which we're in. That environment should be a better place because we are there. So let's break those down a little bit more. Salt brought flavor or brings flavor and preservation. If you want to insult someone's cooking, call it bland. What'd you think of the meatloaf? It was kind of bland. Salt has a way of of adding flavor to all sorts of recipes, doesn't it? And often what's the thing? What's it it need? Ah, it needs a little more salt. And it often doesn't take much, just a, a pinch or a dash of salt, they say, just to bring out some flavor. 
Salt is so important this that we've developed salt substitutes for people who cannot handle salt in their diets because we don't like bland. We want that flavor. We want that extra ingredient and that's something that Christians should be in an environment, that extra bit of flavor, of grace, of truth, of love, of mercy and forgiveness. Salt was also used to cure and preserve meat. And in ancient times, it was a commodity that could actually be used as currency. It was so important. And so if you wanted to hang on to some meat that you have, because you didn't have a refrigerator, you didn't have a freezer, pack it in salt. And it would keep it for a long time. Well, that's salt. What about light? Well, light brings wisdom and guidance. Proverbs 6.23 says this, For this command is a lamp, this teaching is a light, and correction and instruction are the way to life. Without light, without truth, we stumble along in life. We're not sure which way to go, which path we should take which decisions we should follow. And we find ourselves stumbling through, not sure of what to do, and we can put ourselves in some pretty dangerous places and find ourselves stuck in some areas because we didn't bring any light into the situation. So we are called to be salt and light, to bring wisdom and guidance, flavor and preservation to our environments. But we can be limited in what we do if we allow impurities into our life. As a natural mineral, we like to think that salt begins and remains pure. In fact, one of the questions about this passage, talking about Jesus, is that salt, at its very chemical basic, is, is very stable. But salt comes with and can also take on impurities that limit what it's supposed to do. Whether these are industrial uses or at our dinner table, it needs to be purified and then kept purified for use. Just think about for a moment, if you let moisture into your salt shaker, what happens? You can't use it very well. It wants to clump up. And each source of salt, whether it comes from the sea or from the ground or from lakes, brings its own set of impurities that to this day must be dealt with. And there are whole industries behind this about getting salt ready to be used. In the same way, light can be diminished if it is covered over. Sometimes we we like a little mood lighting. We like things dim. We do that here. We've got various color effects here for us. But often we need bright, strong lights to see what we're doing. Imagine a surgeon is getting ready to operate, do some open heart surgery and says, could I have a little mood lighting please? Can we put a, put a blue filter or gel over that light, just kind of bring the, the room down? Now we, we want that surgeon to see what they need to see, don't they? So impurities, if we allow impurity into our life, if we allow sin to take hold in our lives, it will diminish our effectiveness. This is why we're called to confess our sin, to grow in Christ, to leave behind the immature things so we can be more effective in enhancing our environments with light and salt that we are called to be. But we're also aware that we need to avoid being corrosive or glaring. If you're in a a salt area, a sea area, a place with a lot of salt, it can corrode metal easily. What do we have to do after a few days of snow and salt on the roads? What are we supposed to do with our cars? Run them through the car wash to get that salt off there, lest it become corrosive to our cars. Same way light, you shine it right in somebody's eyes, too bright of a light, can glare and, and make... People duck away and look away. How many times have you traveled either east or west in the morning or the evening on 46 and had that right time of year, that light just shine right in your eyes, hit your windshield in such a way you can't really see very well? 
We need to be careful as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, not to be glaring in our light so that people aren't even looking anymore. And that sometimes happens. Sometimes we want to lead in such a way with truth that we do it in a way that turns people away instead of doing it with gentleness and respect, as the scripture says. And so he brings all this to the point that our actions, our attitudes, and our words should light the way to the Father. We're not here to glorify a congregation. We're not here to glorify ourselves. We're not here to call attention to any group that we're with. We are to point the way to the Father. People should see what we're doing and have an understanding of who the Father is. Jesus said that if you saw him, you saw the Father. And we don't have that exact same representation, but when people see the way that we live, they should be thinking, hopefully, about the Father, wanting to know about Him. We should be illuminating His work in our lives in a way that people want to know more. As we've mentioned, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is extremely practical in nature, and it's focused on how we treat and view other people in our daily interactions. And in doing so, we bring people to the Father. In his book, The Lost Moon, Apollo 13 astronaut Jim Lovell, any relation, Mike? I'm just curious. No, No, okay. Tells of an interesting encounter with light that he had while he was flying a fighter jet in the sea of Japan. It was a very dark night, no moon, and he was trying to follow a homing signal back to his aircraft carrier, but he was picking up actually another homing signal that was leading him away from his carrier. And when he finally rigged figured it out, he realized he needed to find another code, and he had a little panel thing that the pilots constructed that if they plugged it in, it would give them a little bit of light so that he could see the codes he needed to read, and then put that in so he could follow the right homing uh, beacon. But when he did that, it blew out a circuit, and all the lights in his cockpit went out. But in that darkness then, at that moment, he was able to look down and he saw a faint trail of light in the ocean that he realized was algae, phosphorus algae that had been stirred up by the propellers of the aircraft carrier that was leading a trail right to where it was. And all he had to do was follow that trail of light. What a wonderful picture that as we go through life, that we stir up light for people to see and follow to the home, to Father. We, we do that. We bring up that light when we display attitudes of grace and love. When we speak the truth, but do so in love. When we treat people with dignity, when we meet needs, when we are present in times of pain and struggle, we are creating that trail of light to the Father. But why? Why would we do this? What difference does it make? This morning, I would like us to spend a few moments with Nate Latimer of Campus Outreach. He's going to come up here and uh, share a little bit. We support his ministry, his missionary work over at IU. He ministers to the IU campus, singing to bring light to those he meets. And so uh, would you please give a warm welcome to Nate this morning. Nate is um, Nate's going to share uh, just a little bit about his ministry and what he's doing. Then we're going to talk just a little bit about how that might apply and help us understand what we're talking about this morning. So, Nate. That's right. Yeah. Oh, hello. Like Byron said, yeah, my name is Nate Latimer. And if you're going to have to listen to me, you can just know that, uh, yes, I do have a fiance right here, Caitlin Flagg. She's beautiful. We get married July 1st. So if you got to listen to me, you can look at her after this. <clears throat> But yeah, like you said, I'm on staff of the ministry called Campus Outreach. And so uh, that, I've been on staff for four years now. uh, But my freshman year of college is when I was really confronted with the realities of who Christ was and his call on my life. And so I came into college looking for satisfaction and hope and anything I can get my hands on. So with relationships, friends, sports, uh, anything, just living the college dream. And it wasn't until I met a guy on the soccer team 
and a couple of his friends, then I began to see that, man, to follow Christ really has heavier implications on my life than checking off Sunday uh, and going to church with my parents. And so I finally came to terms with who Christ was and saw him not just as the Savior of my sins, but truly as my Lord, and became a Christian, began to walk with God, get established in my faith, and began to develop and grow all through college leading up till 2013 when I graduated and had a chance to come on staff with CEO and help students wrestle with those same questions. And so for the past four years, me and a couple other people started Campus Hours, this new ministry at IU to help students wrestle with those same questions. And so my day-to-day, I don't have an office on campus. I don't, uh, students don't line up to come meet with me or ask me about the greater realities and spiritual questions in life. But instead, I'm in the food courts, I'm in the dorms, I'm in the fraternities every day, uh, meeting guys where they're at to help them wrestle with and confront the call of Christ on their lives. Okay. I'm, I'm curious, Nate, what does it darkness look like these days for college students? You know, many folks have been on college campuses, but for some, it's been a year or two. And uh, so, so what's, what's going on? What's with the reality out there for a lot of college students? Yeah. I think, of, I think of the little 500 and I think of IU and kind of like the epitome and dream of what a lot of these kids come in thinking like this is what college is. And I think of two weeks ago during the little five and getting three emails and missed phone calls and voicemails from this IU emergency system of two near abductions during the little 500 in the middle of the night, like 3 a.m. of girls wander, like walking on campus and guys almost abducting them. And I think of... Like that is a very stark picture of what darkness is at IU. And just a scratching the surface of what's really going on and all the unreported cases. I think of all the guys looking for hope and security. I had a, an event, a fraternity with like 50 guys hanging out in the courtyard and they just had cases and cases of beer. And this was last Thursday night. And so it's school night, finals are coming up and these guys are just looking for hope in anything they can get their hands on. And so I think that's kind of what look, darkness looks like on the campus right now. And so what does that look like for you, helping them on a day-to-day basis find that light? You know, you talked about places that you are, but so what does that look like as you try to bring that light into where they're at? Yeah, yeah, it's being in those places, being in the world, but not of the world. I think that's a, like very classic common saying, but I really do think it's true and rings uh, correct of, man, I'm gonna be in these places uh, but the way I respond, the way I act, and what I talk about, what I don't talk about, is a way to be different in those areas. And so in the fraternities with these guys talking about terrible things, and I'm not laughing at their jokes, and instead I'm pointing them to Jesus. And uh, yeah, it's meeting them where they're at and not waiting for them to come to me, kind of where, that, which is exactly what Jesus did and what he did with me. He didn't wait for me to find him, he came to me. Can you share with us any specific things, uh, lives that you've seen that have been changed by light, uh, some of the stories of encounters that you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. I think of, uh, I think of, this, I think of a student, his name's David. He is a junior right now. He's a human biology major. He's going to take the MCAT in about a month, and he's off to med school after that. And I met him his freshman year in the food court, we became friends. We started meeting up. We started having a Bible study. He started coming to our weekly meeting that we have on campus. And finally, he ended up, uh, in January of his freshman year, ended up asking, it's like, man, what do I do? Like, I want to follow this Jesus. I want to come to Christ. What do I need to do? And we prayed together, and he became a Christian. And for the, over the past two years, we've been deepening, and I've been equipping, establishing him in his faith. <clears throat> and this year, he's seen two guys come to Christ, and he's, now he's helping them, and he's discipling them. And now they're all spending the next nine weeks at our summer project called the Orlando Project, to deepen and grow in their faith and learn how to walk with God. So I think it's just through the picture of spiritual multiplication of reaching, it just takes each one to reach one and reaching this one guy. And it's like, without him, it's like, man, these guys, they're like the light switch has been flipped on in these two other guys' lives. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Hopefully you got a chance to understand a little bit of what Nate is doing there and our support for him and how that's making a difference on that campus. And there are people like Nate on a lot of our campuses, but there are not enough. There are, there's a lot of darkness out there. There's, and not just on our college campuses, 
It's in our workplaces. It's in our schools. It's in our neighborhoods. Sometimes it's in our own homes. The world needs light, and it needs us to be light, to be prepared to be light for other people, and to make the difference that they need. And what we've seen here, and I appreciate that story, Nate, of how sharing the light with one person leads that light to being passed on to another. And you've all probably been a part of a candle lighting ceremony when you take a light and you add your light to someone else and they pass that light around and it just goes until the room is fully illuminated with that light. So how can you and I shine and shine brighter than we normally do? First off, as Nate has pointed out, it's often it's just being there. We have to be willing to go where darkness is. It is very tempting to just stay in a place where everybody else believes the same thing we do, where everybody likes us, where everybody values what we value, but we will not be light and salt that the world needs if we remain cloistered together rather than going out. And it's not that you necessarily have to go somewhere new. It's going where you normally go, but being willing to be intentional about being light and salt in what you're doing. The way that you do your job, the way that you teach in the classroom, the way that you conduct yourself. As Nate pointed out, if, wow, that's a lot of gossip going over here. I don't think I'll join in that gossip. I don't think I'll laugh at that joke. I'll, I don't have to say something overt, but I can show that I'm maybe not comfortable in an environment or being a part of something that is tearing other people down. I want to be a part of grace and truth. So how can we shine brighter? We need to remain connected to the power source. This little light needs a power source. There's a battery in there. But even that battery can run down after a while, and so it has a little holder that it can sit in, and it can get brighter. This little lamp that you see right here, the lamp is in it, or the light bulb is in it, and I can flip the switch around, but there's a problem. The light bulb's not in as tightly as it needs to be. We need to see that brighter source that comes from being connected, fully connected, resting in, abiding in Jesus. Listen to what he said. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Take that light bulb out and it does not shine. Unplug it from its power source, it does not shine. It has to remain connected to the power source, and the same is you and I. Now, we can be tempted to be a little bit like this charger, this little flashlight, and think, well, I only need to get charged every, so, every now and then. But instead, we need to see ourselves more like this lamp, constantly connected, constantly abiding in Christ. We're not just looking for coming in on Sunday morning and getting recharged throughout the week, we need to be abiding in Christ. We need to remind ourselves daily, hourly, even moment by moment, that life in Christ is powered by Christ himself. Our significance, our hope, our calling, all originate in him. And whatever little cues you can give yourself, I have a friend who has a watch that every so often it, it just beeps, and that reminds him to remind himself that he is abiding in Christ, that his source of power for the ministry that he's doing comes from Christ. Remember the little thing we did a number of weeks ago where you are all standing and started to sit down in your seats? Do we need to do that again? No. <laughs> you start to sit down and trying to be in between, it's very difficult. But there comes that moment when you rest in that seat and it feels good. You need to remind yourself throughout the day that your power for living for him comes from him. 
And your job is to stay connected to him, to be thinking about him, talking with him, reading his word, thinking about his word and how it applies to your various situations. We want this to be a a seven-day-a-week activity, not one day a week. In that moment of darkness the other night, Angie and I really... Oh, I missed a point. Sorry. Another way to shine brighter is to illuminate what people are ready to see when they're ready to see it. That moment of darkness the other night, Angie and I we really weren't too worried about the deeper truths of life. We just didn't want to bump into things. We just wanted to be able to walk across the room and not trip or fall down. That's what light does. The truth is that if people aren't ready for light, they will reject it. You ever try to turn on the light on somebody that you've been in a darkened room and suddenly just flip on a light on them? And what do they do? Dark. Do this with your kids in the morning. It's a fun way to get them up in the morning. <laughs> I used to give my girls a warning that the light was going to come on after so long because they needed that warning. But when you suddenly get that glare, you're not ready for it. And we need to be sensitive to how much truth or guidance people are ready for. And one way to tell is what they're asking. If I try to tell someone who does not even believe there is such a thing as sin about their need for forgiveness from sins, that conversation is not going anywhere. Sometimes we have to back all the way up to some elemental things, but it helps to find out where people are at, what are they asking, what do they want to know because that's the light that they will receive. And finally, we shine brighter when we simply love others. Remember what the second commandment was? The second greatest commandment according to Jesus? First, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is? Love your neighbor. Many of you may remember the name of Ray Charles, an American singer, songwriter, musician, composer. He lost his sight at age seven, but he adapted to his blindness, and he sharpened his senses to become a very independent person. One of the amazing things about him that I I read a number of years ago was that at the age of 18, he traveled by bus from Florida to Seattle, Washington. He didn't know anyone on the bus, And he didn't know anyone in Seattle. He just knew there was a good music scene up there, and he wanted to go there. That's how independent he had become. Now, he might seem like an example of someone who can just adapt to darkness and get by fine, but here's something else I had to think about. The bus driver needed the light. The piano makers, the pianos that he played, needed light to do what they did. Those who built the sound equipment that recorded his music needed light. And there are those who say they do not need the light that Christians can bring into the world, yet they are living in a world that has benefited from the light that we have brought over the last 2,000 years. There's been a lot of good that has come from people following Jesus Christ. We don't want to lose sight of that. In fact, we might want to remember it. There are a lot of hospitals that have been built by people of faith. A lot of universities built by people of faith. Indiana University started out as a seminary. People of faith have often tried to bring light and salt into their world. So how do we let our light shine brighter than maybe it has late, lately? Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships that I might boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now what's he saying here? He said, you know what, I can preach the great sermons. I can tell and shout out to the world the truth about Christ and his resurrection, but if I don't have love, they won't hear it. It will make no difference. 
And so that secret ingredient in what we do becomes love. And what does that look like? Well, he tells us here. What is this love? It is patient. It is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And it always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. And it always perseveres. Love itself never fails. What does the world need? It needs the truth that we have for it. It needs the truth of the gospel. It needs the truth that there is a God who created everything around them, everything around us. It needs that truth. The world needs to know we are not just here by accident, by chance, by natural selection. We are here because the creator intended for us to be here. And because of that, we have a purpose in this world. But it won't hear that if we are acting in unloving ways when we share that truth. And what we're going to see in the coming weeks is how to be loving to the world around us. Even our enemies. Because that's how we let our light shine brighter. When we bring grace and truth into the equation, into the environment. So let me ask you to simply think about this. What would grace and truth, what would love look like in your environments? What does it look like where you work? What's it look like in your home? What would it look like in your neighborhood? It may not be you going around knocking door to door Asking people, if you died tonight, do you know where you would spend eternity? But it may be mowing somebody's lawn that needs it. Looking for a way to make someone know that they are not alone in this universe. To bring some light and salt into their life. Why don't you take a moment and you pray about what that might look like for you, where you're living, where you're working, where you're playing. Why don't you talk to God about that for a moment and then I'll close this in prayer. Father, we are reminded just now that you're always wanting to talk to us. You're always wanting to listen. That you care about what we have to say. You care about our lives. And Lord, we ask that as we think about how we can be salt and light wherever we're going, whatever we're doing, that you would help us to understand that we can't do this on our own. Too often our default mode is grouchiness or self-centeredness. How can we get to the front of the line? How can we be served? Help us to see, Father, how we can turn that around and be different. Serve and give and love in very real and practical ways so that the world will know there is a creator who created them, who loves them to this day and wants them back in a relationship with you. Father, help us. It's not an easy thing, but it's a possible thing when we remain and abide in you. So help us this week, whatever we're doing, in our speech, our attitudes, our actions, may they be seasoned with grace, mercy, love for our neighbors. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for taking time out of your day to watch this week's message. I hope it really encouraged you in your own walk with God. 
If you heard anything in the message and you'd, you'd like to speak with someone or if you'd simply like to connect with someone on staff, we'd be really excited to hear from you. Please feel free to contact us at the email address or phone number below. Otherwise, thanks for watching.